good morning, everybody. If uh, your experience is anything like mine, uh, you come to Velocity for the great talks, for the great tips, but you're also probably leaving with a lot of questions for like, what's the best pattern? Should, this, should I apply this on my site? What are other sites doing? And perhaps the best resource that we have as a community is HTTP Archive. So very briefly, if you're not familiar with this project, uh, we're actually crawling the web about 300,000 top 300,000 uh, desktop sites and top 10,000 mobile sites twice a month. And we're archiving all of the metadata about how many requests it took, what the size of each payload is, and all the rest. So this is a lot of data, and one thing you probably haven't noticed before, if, even if you visited the site, is that you can actually download all of this data. So you can export about a terabyte of data of all of that metadata and analyze it on your own. Which, of course, sounds like fun, except it's not because it becomes a big data problem at that point, right? And uh, that gets in the way. So thankfully at Google, we actually have a lot of tools uh, that we've built along the way to help us with this sort of thing. And Dremel is an internal tool that we've been using at Google. And it's also now available as an external product, which is BigQuery. So I figured, hey, if we can take the, the data that's available from HTTP Archive, put it into this public data set, and make it available to everybody such that you don't have to worry about importing, you can just write the queries, that'd be really awesome. So that's exactly what it is. Uh, you can actually just go to the BigQuery console. The data is there. You can just run your queries. And we also have a community site around it where a lot of people are actually doing a lot of in really interesting analysis. But let me actually show you uh, instead of talking about it. So here's BigQuery. Uh, we have the, you're looking at the request table for one of the crawls that we did a couple of months back. And as you can see here, there's a lot of data. Uh, things like what are the response headers, what are, what are the request headers, and all the rest. So now we can start kind of interrogating that data with fun questions like, hey, I'm curious, what is the uh, cache, caching lifetime of all the different assets? So we can extract that using some regular expressions. And uh, we can actually run that query. And we'll get back some numbers. Oh, let me see. Let's go here. And uh, we can get the data back. And you'll find that you know, if you put it on a nice graph, that we actually have kind of particular milestones where people are just picking like one day, one hour, and all the rest, which is kind of fun. Uh, you, you can, of course, make this arbitrarily more complex and rewrite your query uh, with some additional statements and figure out that actually 62% of all of the resources don't have a cache control or a max age header, or, or lifetime, I should say. So that's a bit of a problem. So that's all good and well. But if you haven't visited BigQuery's uh, before, I definitely encourage you to come to the site and just play with it because there's lots of interesting analysis. But let's go back to this data set. If you have played with this data, one thing you've noticed is like, hey, I've downloaded a lot of data, maybe a terabyte, but there's still no response bodies. Like we're only giving you the HTTP request headers and response headers. And wouldn't it be cool if we actually gave you the response bodies as well? So as an experiment, that's uh, what we did. And you'll find a new table now, which is request body. And it contains the, the actual resource URL and the decompressed content of that actual file, so the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And we've imported all of that. And if you look at this, uh, this is about 200 gigs. So we have about another terabyte of data of imported JavaScript, CSS, and HTML uh, into BigQuery. And here's an example. You have an HTML file, and you have the full payload, because you know what could go wrong with stuffing arbitrarily sized HTML, CSS, and JavaScript into your database? Well. Now that we have this data, we can start asking really fun questions. Like, for example, uh, Brian was on stage uh, just before, and we actually have a different project called GitHub Archive, which is archiving all of the commit messages and all of the uh, things going into GitHub. So one of the best examples I've seen, or at least I've enjoyed the most, is somebody did analysis of the emotions displayed in the commit messages. So just extracting keywords and like, do you feel angry, do you feel happy, and all the rest. So I figured, like, you know, this was really interesting. He analyzed like anger in commit messages, and he found that if you're programming Vim or C or Shell, <laughs> then you're a really angry programmer. But apparently PHP is like Zen, so I don't know. Maybe your experience is different. But I figured like, hey, you know, we have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What if we did the same? So I took the queries, I massaged them a little bit, ran some regular expressions. And so this is specifically for CSS, and you can see the results here. We have over a million CSS files, and apparently CSS pro people that program CSS are very zen, because 98% of the files just contain like apparently no emotion whatsoever. But then 1% of the time, they experience joy, which is kind of cool. 
and then Angular. So let's actually visualize this. So I built, let me go back. So here's CSS. So about less than, or maybe uh, it's 1% of people feel joy, uh, amusement, they're surprised. Uh, they're not swearing much, or, or they're not angry either. So this is kind of cool. Now let's add JavaScript into the mix. Well, <laughs> all of a sudden, if you're programming JavaScript, you're way more amused because of like, oh my god, that actually worked. <laughs> but then when it doesn't work, you're swearing. Then once you fix it, I guess you feel joy. But interestingly enough, uh, you're not nearly as angry as CSS programmers. So, huh. Now let's add HTML to the mix, because now you're combining both, right? And, well, you're amused, because you're like, wow, that actually worked. But then you're swearing a lot, because most of the time it doesn't work, until you fix it, and then you feel joy. And you're also very angry. So, I don't know, I, I guess that's what you call a full stack developer right there. <laughs> all right, so moving on to something a little bit more serious, right? So we're talking about web performance, we have all of this HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, what could we do with it? Well, one of the things that we've certainly had, I think, a number of talks even at this conference, conference is blocking scripts and third-party dependencies. So could we extract some interesting things out of this data set? The only problem is these are very large strings, right? Like this is 40 kilobytes of HTML. So if only we had a tool to extract arbitrary data from this. So interestingly enough, uh, earlier this year, the BigQuery team announced something that I would I thought I would never see, but they added user-defined functions, which basically allows us to run arbitrary JavaScript inside of our SQL. Yes, <laughs> that's a good idea. So just, just follow with me. So we're doing a select query against our table, and inside of it, we're gonna pass each field, we're gonna declare an output schema, which is like, we're gonna, this is gonna be the output, and then we just provide a regular JavaScript function where you know I can just put a regular expression and extract arbitrary chunks of data out of this thing. Then you iterate through and you emit all the different records. So you take in one thing and you can emit multiple records, which is kind of cool. So I run this here. Um, and just for making query simple, I'm actually outputting the results into a separate table. So let me show you the, the actual result of this table. So we ran this query, and you can see that the Verge actually has a lot of different scripts that they're including on their page. So, so these are the different uh, scripts that we've extracted, right? So we took the HTML, and we're just looking at uh, the script tags. So now we can run other queries, kind of follow-on queries on top of this. As an example, uh, we can add more regular expressions, because what could go wrong, and uh, extract what are the attributes that are being used on the script tags. And if we do that, we will find that uh, one of the most popular ones is type, so type JavaScript, uh, source. So about uh, 3,800 files out of 12,000 files are including external files, which is in kind of interesting because it tells you that the majority of scripts are actually inline scripts on most pages. And uh, in particular, I was actually interested in how many scripts use async or defer, the HTML5 keywords for making the scripts async. And sadly, I found that out of 12,000, 67 use the async keyword, and about 36 use the defer keyword. So less than 1%, which is kind of sad. But then, of course, you know, you're thinking, okay, fine, so there's a lot of inline scripts, but I can asynchronously load scripts by uh, loading them through JavaScript itself. So we can account for that as well. You can write another query which extracts, looks at the actual content of the JavaScript, and finds cases where we're injecting scripts using inline scripts. Running that same query, we find that 632 files, or 632 script blocks, are doing exactly that. So as a quick summary, let's recap. We have 12,000 scripts on, on the top 1,000 pages. Less than 1% are actually using the async or defer keywords and about 5% are using inline scripts to inject other scripts, which I thought was kind of interesting. And I think this just opens the door for a lot of other interesting follow-up analysis. And you know, I, I put a disclaimer here, it's perfectly plausible that some of my regular expressions are completely broken, uh, which you know, has never happened before. But nonetheless, right, 5% and less than 1%. Uh, the only summary I could come up with was this, for a web performance conference, because as we all know, uh, scripts should be async. 
So in conclusion, I encourage you guys to check out BigQueries. Uh, there's a lot of interesting analysis there. We now have response bodies, so please do some fun, fun stuff there. Thanks. That was fantastic. Thanks, Ilya. Um, I do want to give uh, a lot of thanks for the tremendous and stupendous work that Ilya and Pat Meenan have done with HTTP Archive, uh, Ilya putting the data into BigQuery so that anyone can run uh, any kind of analysis that they want. We've had that in there for about a year, and if you look at that BigQuery.es uh, website, you can see about 50 or 60 uh, examples of customized analyses that people have run for the questions that they want to answer. And now having the response bodies in there, I haven't played with it yet, uh, but I'm excited to look for things like how many people are loading Google Analytics async versus the old document.write pattern. Um, uh, so I think that will open up a lot of um, interesting analyses that we can run. And speaking of Pat Meenan, um, HTTP Archive runs on top of web page test, and our next lightning demo um, is going to talk about adding automation to uh, on top of web page test. Um, so our speakers are uh, Uva Belsa and Niels Kuhn. Yep, Please help me great. welcome uh, them to the stage. So thanks a lot, Steve. Um, high velocity. Uh, Velocity is about performance of web pages and operations, and OpenSpeed Monitor tries to bring both things together. Back in 2011, we've started a project to improve the performance of uh, Germany's second largest e-commerce site, and we did search for a solution to continuously monitor the web performance of our pages. Unfortunately, we didn't find one reliable and open source solution, so we built our own tool, Speed Monitor, and we used it uh, in the last two years, and uh, it helped a lot. So we thought uh, it could be helpful for other people as well, and we've decided to bring it open source, and here we are with Open Speed Monitor now. So let's create our first measurement. Uh, we create a script, uh, give it a name, uh, you can give it a short description, and then you write the script with the same scripting language uh, web page test is using. Uh, we have a nice uh, script editor with syntax highlighting and code completion, which is really helpful for people that are not familiar with the page test. So here we are with our first script. And um, uh, now we need a job to run the script. And again, we create a job, um, give it a name, uh, select the location where it should run, let's say on a Firefox browser. And uh, one important setting here is uh, execution schedule, where you can use a simple cron statement um, to um, schedule the job. And uh, let's say we start it every 15 minutes. Um, we link the job to a job group to find it later on. We select the connection speed. Let's say it should be in DSL measurement. Uh, we select the script we want to run in this job. And uh, of course, you can set every other setting that is useful for web page test measurements. So now we have a job. We are back on our job list. Uh, and uh, from here, you can start your job manually or you activate it, and then it, that, uh, this implements the scheduling. Um, the job list has one nice additional feature. Um, you can watch the actually running jobs uh, in your environment. You can cancel them, or you can watch what's happening. Uh, in the lower right, you see a small window. It's a team viewer session running on our agent where the job is running. So now we have a running measurement that will measure every 15 minutes uh, our page. So let's look onto the results we get from those measurements. We switch to the measurement results dashboard. Uh, we select an aggregation uh, window. So let's start with the raw data and the time frame we are interested in, let's say some days. We filter our jobs um, and um, say we want to see auto a product page on a Firefox. Uh, with uh, doc complete time for first and repeated view. And here we are. Uh, you have uh, the timelines for the different measurements. Um, you can uh, select a smaller window that you are interested in to see some glitch uh, in your measurements. You can drag it this window around, or you can deselect or reselect um, some of the timelines to get a better view of the interesting part. In this dashboard page, you can compare nearly everything. So you can compare first and repeated view, but you could also compare 
um, um, your page speed with your competitors or compare measurements with different browsers or with different connection speeds or with different viewports and so on. So one important feature of this view is that you can directly go to the uh, measurement uh, that happened. Uh, you click onto one data point um, and uh, comes to the web page test result page um, that you are used to. So we did this for some time and uh, sooner or later you experience that it takes some time to get the job, start the browser, uh, run the page, wait for fully loaded, send the results back. And if you try um, to do this for all your pages every five minutes on different browsers with different connection speeds and for your competitors and so on, um, then it takes a lot of agents to do this. So agent capacity was an issue for us. Um, Helpfully, web page test already supports scripting with multiple pages in it. So let's create a, JIP, a script uh, where we call three pages. Uh, let's say we call the home page first. Uh, after this, we call a search, and then we switch to a product detail page from the search. Um, unfortunately, uh, web page test delivers only one result for such a script. So instead of 10 results for a script with 10 pages, you get only one result. Results. So we've created our own um, patched version of web page test, um, which added a missing multi-step capability. So let's look at what we get out of a script now. So we select uh, our new job group with a multi-step measurement, uh, select some pages, and um, here we are. We have uh, timelines for all the pages that are in the script. And if we now switch to our result view, Again, we are on a web page test view, um, um, but it is slightly changed. So look at the whole page. Um, we go to the beginning and we see we have now overview section for all pages within the script. And if we scroll down, then we see that we have all the waterfalls for all the pages and we have here connection views for all the pages and so on. So we have now the, all the measurements that you uh, get from web page test, but for all pages within the script. The really interesting thing happened when we compared the results from single step measurements with multi step measurements. So we select both job groups uh, and uh, our product page. And if you look onto the results, and uh, then we see now this is the first view of our uh, page in the single step measurement. And uh, uh, the green one is the first view, uh, is the repeated view of the single step measurement. Uh, but the dark blue one is the first view of the customer journey. So what's happening here? If you look into the details, it's clear. It's all about caching. Uh, all the pages use the same third-party JavaScript frameworks, the same CSS pages. And in the customer journey, all those artifacts are coming from the browser cache So during loading this page. So the question is, which is the right measurement to watch in our monitoring? And we did some statistics uh, on our shop and only 5% of all page views are entry pages. So it skips the first view in single step. And only 3% are revisits for the same page within our visit. So steps a repeated view from our single step. More than 90% of all page views happens in customer journeys. So that's the one that we are monitoring. And if you want to see more of OpenSpeed Monitor features, um, come to office hour. Thanks a lot.